Today, our press is at the mercy of a few dominant platforms that are designed to harvest and exploit people's attention and data. The overwhelming majority of Americans access news online through Facebook and Google, while most traffic and advertising revenue online is channeled through these dominant platforms. Only a few years ago, discussions about privacy rights online were hamstrung over debates about the actual harms of pervasive data collection. We have since learned that Cambridge Analytica, a foreign political consulting firm, harvested the personal information of approximately 87 million Facebook users to create Steve Bannon's psychological warfare tool. We also know that the truthfulness of the information shared with users through this campaign was irrelevant to its architects. The sole measure of their success was determined by their ability to manipulate citizens and affect democratic outcomes. In the wake of this scandal, it's clear that corporate surveillance can be used to directly undermine the backbone of our democracy, our electoral system, by enabling highly tailored political targeting of misinformation campaigns. Roger McNamee, a venture capitalist, wrote last year that this system is rife and practically designed for abuse. And he said, and I quote, any advertiser can get access to any Facebook user over unsupervised automated systems. Five million advertisers do so every month. The Russians took advantage of this first to sow discord among Americans and then to interfere in the 2016 election. Other bad actors exploited Facebook in other areas. Our, one company surveilled protest groups and marketed that data to police departments, end quote. What's more, the proliferation of misinformation online has made it nearly impossible for people to distinguish between propaganda and false news from factual reporting. In a recent study concerning news and trust, nearly two-thirds of Americans reported that they could not distinguish false news from quality journalism on the internet. It's overwhelmingly clear that this enormous unchecked power to dictate and profit from what people see online is a fundamental threat to democratic systems and values. But in response to these problems, these dominant platforms, the choke points for information online, refuse to consistently enforce their policies against hate speech, conspiracy theories, or disinformation. They will not ban pages that share dangerous hoaxes. Their algorithms are tailored to boost content on the basis of engagement, resulting in feedback loops and filter bubbles of extremist content and misinformation at the expense of trustworthy journalism. Professor Jay Rosen of New York University recently referred to this as confession of weakness and evidence of a Goliath that is unable to grasp problems and make decisions. Just yesterday, Facebook Mar CEO Mark Zuckerberg refused to condemn the denial of the Holocaust as a violation of Facebook's community standards. As the Anti-Defamation League noted, Holocaust denial is a willful, deliberate, and long-standing deception tactic by anti-Semites that is incontrovertibly hateful, hurtful, and threatening to Jews that does not belong in civil discourse online. There's no question that we've reached a tipping point in our country that demands that we restore and protect our democracy. Internationally, the human toll of information silos is far graver. Facebook and other platforms have been outright blocked in other countries due to their role in spreading and amplifying hate speech. In Myanmar, human rights experts at the United Nations report that Facebook has played what they called a determining role in fomenting acts of genocide against the Rohingya. Similar to the role of extremist radio in enabling unimaginable violence and death in Rwanda, UN investigators said that Facebook has turned into a beast in Myanmar. In an open letter to Facebook in April, representatives from Myanmar civil society organizations wrote that Facebook's tools are being used to incite real harm in an unprecedented and countrywide basis. But rather than respond to this life and death abuse of its platform, Facebook refused to send the engineering teams necessary to comprehensively remove hate content from its platform. Instead, it printed copies of its community standards in local newspapers and made other symbolic gestures that did little to suppress violence stemming from its content. Yesterday, facing immense public pressure, Facebook finally acknowledged that it has a responsibility to not just reduce or explain this content on its platform, but to remove it altogether. In other countries, an expression uh, and really a, a tremendous explosion of misinformation and hate speech have ignited civil unrest 
and contaminated the electoral process. Last year, viral false reports of child abductions spread across eastern India, inciting panic, tribal lynchings, and other violence. In Kenya's 2016-17 election, the proliferation of fake accounts, misinformation, and false news have drowned out traditional journalism, massively shaped popular discourse, and marred electoral outcomes with violence and civil unrest. <clears throat> According to statements made by the managing director of Cambridge Analytica, the political consulting firm designed just about every element of Kenyan President Kenyatta's election campaigns in 2013 and 2017. Using data from Facebook and third-party apps to track Kenyan voters, Cambridge Analytica deployed a combination of false news and digital propaganda to stir ethnic tensions in an effort to win votes. In the months leading up to and following the election, more than 100 Kenyans died in rounds of violence uh, related to the election, according to Human Rights Watch. In South Sudan, Facebook and other social platforms have been used by partisans to exaggerate <coughs> incidents, spread falsehoods, and veil threats, or post outright messages of incitement, according to a 2016 report to the UN Security Council. In other countries with limited press freedom, Facebook's experimental manipulation of the newsfeed algorithm has collapsed traffic to trustworthy sources of news and amplified misinformation. In Cambodia, where the government has cracked down on political activists in the press, many Cambodians don't realize that news has been effectively removed from Facebook, according to an editor at the Phnom Penh Post. In Bolivia, traffic to news sites critical of the Bolivian government dropped precipitously as a result of this change, deepening political divides. And in Slovakia, news publishers reported that they were forced to pay Facebook to appear in the news feed, and that as a result of the changes, Facebook had fueled the spread of fake news within the country. In each of these cases, local news publishers complain that they have little recourse or explanation for the changes, underscoring Facebook's fundamental lack of accountability on these matters. As a lawyer and a longtime supporter of human rights and civil liberties, I believe we must make every effort to ensure that speech and press are protected, particularly in the context of civil discourse and the pursuit of political truth. While I'm sympathetic to the concern that platforms should not be the arbiter of speech online, the truth is that Facebook and Google already control what people see. By amplifying false news and violent content at the expense of quality journalism, these platforms have already become the arbiters of truth through both their action and their inaction. It's clear to me that our unshakable belief in press freedom must not serve as a shield to excuse dominant platforms from corporate responsibility or a sword for dictators and extremists to sow civil unrest and violence. Given the sheer size of these platforms and the control they exert over the, this discourse as gatekeepers of information, they must be held to account. Facebook's inconsistent and arbitrary enforcement of its own community standards, particularly in a way that fails to distinguish between speech and demonstrably false content or calls to violence, is evidence that it's, that it's unable or unwilling to address these problems. Facebook also wants to have it both ways, in my view. In an interview yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg said that breaking up Facebook could invite Chinese companies with significantly worse values to fill this void. While I share concerns about Chinese companies not supporting our values, it's unclear how Facebook's surveillance machine, which is rife with exploitation, is an inherently better product for consumers anywhere. Furthermore, the natural consequence of behaving like absentee lord, landlords is that despots will use violence or hate speech as an excuse to crack down on political activism and free expression online. So the question is, where do we go from here? It's clear that our domestic policy needs to catch up to our current reality. If American internet platforms demonstrate that they're too big to behave responsibly, then our competition system must act as a backstop. The startling influence of these platforms on democracies across the world is evidence that our antitrust laws have not lived up to their purpose and full potential of protecting economic and political freedom. For too long, these companies have acquired their competitors with little impunity or oversight. Carl Shapiro, who formerly served as the top economist of the Justice Department's antitrust division, has argued that applying tougher standards to these types of mergers that harm potential competition is a promising way to reverse this trend. I also believe that unless these companies do more to acknowledge and address these issues, 
Congress should take steps to ensure that American companies do not amplify violent and demonstrably false speech at home and around the world. As the ranking member of the House Antitrust Subcommittee, I will continue to use my voice to raise this issue and push Congress to take them seriously and to hold companies to account. As in so many other areas, civil society has been out ahead on this issue for many years, working through forums such as the Internet Governance Forum and developing projects like the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, it's imperative that this work continue. The U.S. State Department also plays an important role in funding many open Internet in initiatives around the world. I support these efforts through my position on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and for my part, I plan to work with my colleagues on the committee to explore ways we can ensure that diverse voices from around the world are heard in this conversation, and to do everything we can to make sure that civil society has the support that it needs through the State Department and USAID to build on the work of the NED, SIPE, SEMA, NDI, and many others who are already doing work on this front and work that is incredibly important. Uh, a century ago, John Dewey commented that democracy must be reborn with each generation, and education is its midwife. We must commit ourselves to strengthening democracy in our own time, and I sincerely believe that today's conversation on reclaiming the internet for democracy serves that important goal, and thank all of you who will be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I think um, that was a really, really interesting speech, and I think it really lays out some of the challenges that we face. They're broad. They come from different uh, sectors, whether it's governments or large global platforms. Uh, citizens around the world are confronting challenges uh, that impede them from uh, engaging in democratic discourse online. And, and that really is uh, the reason that SEMA, NDI, and SIPE started the Open Internet for Democracy initiative approximately two years ago. And just to give you a, a little background on, on where we've been, uh, the first part of this project was to develop uh, a set of norms and principles around what it means for the, the internet to be democratic. And that um, was, uh, took the form of democratic principles for an open internet. And this is, uh, you can grab this by the door. And this was put together collaboratively by about 75 organizations within our partner networks. And it has nine principles that state what, uh, what the internet needs to look like so that people can engage freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, the, the right types of governance forms that are inclusive. And so the next phase of this project is actually what brings me to the speakers today, because they are our open internet leaders. And they um, were selected out of a pool of 186 candidates from 66 countries worldwide uh, to help us take this to the next level and develop a, a global digital rights advocacy playbook that can put these principles into action at the local, regional, and even at the international level at internet governance forums like the IGF that the congressman mentioned. Um, and it's, they've been in DC working very hard this week on that playbook, and I've had the opportunity to spend some time with them, and it has really been an amazing experience for me to see the breadth of expertise and perspectives that they have and I think when we're, we're thinking about some of the large challenges like the ones that the congressman brought up, I, I, what I've been thinking the past couple days is I really want these people to take charge. And that's what this project is about, elevating these voices, because I would feel much more comfortable about an internet uh, where, uh, where you folks um, are, are making decisions and, and guiding the future. So I'm going to ask you now to please come up to the stage. And I'm also going to introduce our moderator, um, yes, please come up to the stage. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our moderator, uh, Mevish Ansari, who is the, uh, a digital program officer from Article 19, um, which is, most of you probably know is one of the, the leading uh, international organizations working on freedom of speech and, and promoting the speech in general. Um, Mevish uh, leads the organization's engagement at the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. Um, and she has a, a history also in working in privacy and technology as she was at the ACLU before she was at Article 19. And so we're really pleased to have Mevish 
uh, an expert in these type of issues moderate the panel. So I'm going to hand it off to Mavish, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, thanks so much, Daniel, and uh, thanks to Congressman Cellini for his remarks at the start of the event. Um, thanks to SEMA and SIP and the NDI for putting together this event, and, and thanks to all of you for, for joining us today. Um, the, in the intent of this panel is really to hear from digital rights defenders and activists who are working within their local communities around the world but how well the internet has been meeting its potential to, you know, as, a, as an enabler, as a medium, and as an infrastructure to provide for democratic participation. Um, and so as part of that, really, we're going to be addressing two main areas of focus. The first, our panelists are going to be talking about some of the challenges that they've encountered in the course of their work. Um, and then moving from there, we're going to be talking about some of the strategies that our panelists advocate for in terms of countering or responding to those challenges. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end of the, of the moderated discussion to have questions uh, from you, from the audience. So um, keep, keep in mind some of the questions that you want to ask them um, as the conversation progresses. Um, and so with that, let's get started with a brief round from our panelists. Um, I think we'll start with Kathleen. Would you mind just giving us your name, what you do within this space, and um, just how you think about the link between digital rights and democracy? Thank you. Um, my name is Kathleen. I'm from Cameroon. I am an entrepreneur and a digital rights activist. Um, I have been working in the space with a coalition of uh, advocates and individual influencers from across Africa called uh, Net Rights, and we basically advocate in the space of policy uh, and legislation and uh, uh, as entrepreneurs um, advocate for a better economy, really, because there's a lot of pushback in that space as well, and we advocate for an, an open internet because those are the fundamental uh, uh, part that is going to give us better governance. So for me, I think that, and I'm trying to keep this very short, I think that social hypnosis has been broken in Africa simply because we have these digital technologies available to us. And it, it, is, it is in our interest to keep it open. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Salal Raza. And uh, I'm from Pakistan, and I work at the intersection of media and digital rights. Uh, currently, I'm running Pakistan's first digital rights news website called Digital Rights Monitor. And uh, a lot of people have been asking me questions about Pakistan and what the country looks like at the moment. And it's very hard for me to explain uh, the complexities that are in Pakistan right now, which are deeply rooted at the social and the political level. Uh, for instance, Pakistan is a country where um, there are certain issues on which I have to self-censor myself. Uh, and there are a lot of other folks from the journalistic community who are self-censoring themselves at the moment. In fact, a research that I did uh, very recently for my organization uh, stated that more than 80% of the journalistic community are self-censoring themselves on certain issues. Uh, but at the same time, while they are self-censoring self themselves, um, there are also certain challenges that they have to face. Uh, in the mainstream media organizations in which they are working. Uh, we have had cases where uh, journalists were not allowed to publish certain articles in, in, in the mainstream media organizations. But uh, you know, I've also seen recently this trend that um, those who do not get their articles published, they are taking to social media, to the, to the Twitter timelines, where they are publishing their content. And that is how they are pushing back against the uh, closing spaces uh, in terms of freedom of expression. Um, on the other hand, um, if you talk about the infrastructure, the internet access in Pakistan is very limited. Uh, less than 20% uh, of the population has access to internet. But it, it is interesting to note that despite the limited accessibility towards internet, um, out of 64 proscribed terrorist organizations, 41 have an active presence on Facebook as well. And they are ac actively trying to reach out to people and also spread their propaganda through Facebook. Uh, 
But also on the other hand, we have uh, uh, marginalized communities uh, who continue to face harassment in the cyberspace. Uh, but they are using this, uh, uh, this medium to identify and uh, expose the harassers and the different groups that are trying to silence their voice as well. Um, in this complex and in this hostile environment, um, uh, I am trying to uh, run a website that specifically looks at the issues of online freedom of expression and freedom of association and assembly. Uh, right now, we are only a week away from the elections, and um, uh, social media is a, is, a, is a tool which is being used by different stakeholders to um, uh, share their ideas on politics. And uh, I, I have to go back and do a research on how Twitter is being used by human bots to manipulate the political conversation as well. Just like in USA, we have these concerns in Pakistan as well, that social media might have the power to manipulate the outcome of the elections as well. You might want to turn on. Oh, thank you, Bella. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Rose, and I'm from the Philippines. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm also a community builder for women in tech, uh, innovation entrepreneurs. So my agenda is, um, as a representative of the um, innovation community, we want to make sure that um, the internet remains open for everyone to have a free flow and access to um, um, content that could help us develop innovative solutions that could somehow um, address poverty in the Philippines and provide a better access to um, basic services like health and education. And so working with the women community, we want to make sure that they have a better access to digital skills while being aware of their um, human rights in the digital space. So we've been doing a lot of workshop and training um, on digital rights literacy and digital literacy. and. Um, in terms of digital digital rights landscape in the Philippines, yeah, we must be heard about um, there are media shutdown or um, the the violation. I mean, the conflict in terms of existing laws like um, existing laws like um, drug acts and the the conflict to persons' privacy because there's been increasing. Um, bills that have been filed to increase wiretapping, surveillance, and this um, posed an alarm to, to the activists and journalists that's been open in, their, in, terms, of their, in terms of their opinions online. So um, apart from that, we, are, we, are, we only have 50% penetrations of internet, so the digital divide is happening in the Philippines, and we want to make, and we wanna make sure that that's not, it won't you know, grow in terms of mag, uh, magnitude, so because we know that the inaccessibility of the people, especially the marginalized sector, who are the ones very affected with this inaccessibility to internet, it deprives them to, to participate in political economic um, activities online. So that's what we are pushing right now. Great. Thanks. Um, my name is Juliet Namfuka. I come from Uganda. I work with the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, otherwise known as CIPESA. My background is in journalism, so I've always had an interest in the movement, the flow of information, who's generating it, how's it moving, where's it going, who's consuming it, and what's happening after that. And that's why I really love being in this space. Um, so there's, the, there's a question, well, as, as, a, as an individual and as an organization, we do a lot of work around creating the evidence to ad advocate for um, uh, digital rights in the continent. We work in countries in East Africa, Southern Africa. We also work in a couple of countries um, in West Africa. But we're also keen on building a network of collaborators, people who can help us advance the agenda with um, adequate skills, adequate um, positioning across the continent and beyond. Um, but there's a question around linking um, an open internet to democracy. And from our perspective, of course, um, we need to look at it from an evidence-based perspective. And we look at it in terms of what is happening with the shrinking civic space, what it means for your ordinary citizen to participate uh, in online um, processes for good governance. So we're seeing internet shutdowns during elections, we're doing, seeing throttling, which is not as obvious as a shutdown, but how do you know that this is happening? What tools are, are being used to measure this? Are people aware that this is actually a tool um, to prevent civic participation in online um, navigation? So we're also seeing, of course, as Talal has also mentioned, um, media and issues around self-surveillance, I mean surveillance, self-censorship, um, as uh, 
uh, Rose has mentioned issues around um, data protection, the absence of it. Um, so there's, a, there's really a pool of issues that we need to address. Um, but ultimately, we want to see that we look at this in w to with the state in terms of creating an enabling space for the movement of information, as opposed to limiting, which is what we're doing through the laws and regulations, through fueling a culture of um, self-censorship, uh, through using um, financial restrictions to limit the ways, the capacity of citizens to participate online, even if it's through a WhatsApp chat group, even if it's through a social media exchange. Um, so we're seeing the, the states moving towards more uh, trickier tools of limiting civic participation, not only in, in governance processes, but in general um, access to information online and freedom of expression. My name is Eduardo, I am from Paraguay. Uh, I'm a human rights defender and activist, and I work at a digital rights organization called TEDIC. So we like to think ourselves as a think and do tank, in a way. So what we're doing is we do a lot of gathering of data and a lot of research in different streams of the actions that we're doing now. So we do research on access to information, on privacy, on freedom of expression, and uh, taking that as a starting point, we try to do public policy impact with officials. We like to engage with government. We like to give them all the information that they need in order to make good decisions around internet and around general aspects of the democracy. So like going into the specific questions of why is the democracy important, uh, like the linkage between internet and the democracy, it's pretty much why I already say, I mean, all of these big names of freedom of expression or access to information, they really need to mean something for the general public. There's no, um, if the internet is going to give power only to the already powerful, there isn't much of a sense of doing the work that we're doing. I mean, if we, we, want, we need to assure that the internet is a force of power for vulnerable communities, for women, for LGBT communities in order for them to speak out in repressive regimes or in places where societies are very much uh, on the interest of shutting them down, of making them silence and not heard their voice and not made their voice heard. So like uh, we love, in Tadik, we love technology and we believe it's an empowering force. We believe that there is so much good and positive change that it can bring, but it's also important to point out the dangers and the inequalities that is all that are already existing in the offline world and are now being translated on the online world. So like taking this as a starting point, we do workshops, we do trainings and reflections that hopefully will make the internet a better, a better place for all of us. Hi, I'm Ines, I'm from Tunisia. I've been advocating for digital rights within the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. So we work a lot with activists around this region, but we also work a lot with the government and government agency. Uh, I'm just gonna be brief and I, w I just wanna make sure the link between the open internet and democracy, I think we can only build democracy if everyone comes to the table, every minority, all women, they should come to the table and discuss this and we can only do this if we have a safe place for everyone if we have an open and secure internet thank you and uh, and with that I think we'll delve into some of the specifics of what each of you have brought to the table and kind of dealing with your particular areas of expertise and I want to start with uh, talking about the news media ecosystem for a little bit uh, news media as an institution is absolutely vital to the right to access to information. Um, and access to information is in itself a necessary precursor to political participation. Um, but even more than that, uh, news media platforms have in themselves become forums where, uh, for, for civic space in itself. 
um, where people can exercise their right to freedom of expression and uh, develop civic discourse in that way as well. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to turn to Talal and Juliet. Uh, both of you are journalists by training. Um, and so I'd love to hear more about your experiences as to the challenges of working within this particular environment, uh, particularly in, the, in recent months. You can go first. <laughs> Pakistani context, um, there was a time when we used to have this discussion that it, there, there are more checks and balances on the mainstream media organizations. So there were certain no-go no -go areas if you want to talk about certain issues, for instance, security policies, you can't really you know, talk about certain areas in the mainstream media organizations. Uh, but um, social media was a space which allowed us some sort of liberty where we could pretty much say everything we, 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 could, we would want to. But this change varied drastically in, since early 2017 when five bloggers were picked up and they were running these Facebook pages that were very critical of certain security policies. And uh, right now, I mean, up to, I mean, it has been more than a year and we are, we are still not able to figure out who were the people who picked them up. But uh, the general understanding is that, that just because they were very critical of the security policies, so this might have annoyed some stakeholders um, in our country. Uh, but then this did not stop there. Uh, there have been lots of journalists, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that they could not get their articles published because they pointed out uh, in a certain direction. Uh, there were people who, who, who were, to the very least, um, they had to encounter smear campaigns. Um, um, I don't want to go into names, but you know, th these smear campaigns may only seem like uh, a short-term, you know, event. You know, some somebody would run a campaign against you over social media, and and and, and it will be done. But no, we have talked to pe these people, and we have and we have come to know that these smear campaigns also have psychological implications. Uh, so people. You know, they stop writing about these issues. They just try to hesitate, and and you know, they just want to avoid the the, the smear campaigns that that continue to happen. And in some instances, you know, if you bring up the issue of blasphemy in Pakistani context, that could even get you killed as well. So you know, you have these different ways of making sure that people do not talk much on certain issues, and then you have these pressures and your mainstream media organizations. So it it really it is it is really becoming challenging to freely operate in, in, in the cyberspace in the Pakistani context as well. Mm. So just, just adding to that, very similar scenarios in many of the countries that we work on as CIPESA. Um, but we've seen very blatant assaults on the media, such as the Zone 9 bloggers who were arrested a few years ago. Um, no opportunity to engage with the courts. Um, assaults are continued up to on their family members simply for publishing a story. Um, and what that did was reinforce the culture of self-censorship within the media in the country. But not only there, it served as a, it has an impact beyond the one country. Because in neighboring countries, there's always that perception that my people could do this to me as well. So it served to reinforce that culture of self-censorship, not only in Ethiopia, but in neighboring countries, where we have seen um, how media houses get into trouble, be, um, get... Um, shut down, we've seen this in Burundi, where it was a very violent assault on media houses which were attacked and shut down, again, during election periods, um, very violently, viola violently. We've seen it in, in Uganda, where we're talking to journalists during some of our digital security workshops, where there's a recurring theme around, I'm not going to publish this, I'd rather, you know, work, stay safe. Um, but beyond that, we're seeing that not on, it's not only the media who is being affected. We are seeing, we've seen a very strong growth of um, bloggers come online. Some of them former media I individuals, others simply people with the capacity to create an audience, to create content which is relevant and informative. Again, often used for democratic uh, participation as a tool, you know, information, access to information. So we've seen... Um, states then expand on what qualifies as a media entity, as a journalist. Um, this was also brought up earlier, where actually just this week, Egypt decided to mention that, or rather enacted, pr in, introduced a bill where, or law, not too sure about that, which states that if you have an, a social media following of more than 5,000 people, you are then looked at as, an, as a media house. 
So we're seeing the narrative around the media, what qualifies as the media, changing, and in so doing, affecting not only the media, but the broader citizenship in how they respond to online content, in how they interact with it, in how they share it as well. So those are some of the subtleties that we're seeing with the internet in more recent uh, months. Of course, also using financial restrictions to um, limit the extent to which media houses are producing content, and of course, um, how bloggers themselves are, are, are generating content. We've seen this in Tanzania, where a law was introduced just this year, where an entity which is posting content online, a blog, a media house, will have to pay up to 900 US dollars to remain online. So we are seeing the cost of being online as an individual and as a, as a media house um, being introduced as a tool to limit the extent to which the state can be criticized, the extent to which information can be moved, um, and the extent to which citizens can freely practice access to information, the, access to the right to information. In the case of Tanzania, it's very critical because they're very predominantly a Swahili speaking language. So where will they get the content if people cannot afford to put it online? Yeah. I think the points you make <coughs> about um, the chilling effect when it comes to speech, particularly for certain communities over others um, in the context of certain political climates, that really, I, I think that leads us right into the idea of inclusion and how inclusion needs to be discussed in tandem with um, freedom of expression and access to information. Um, it's inclusion as, as a principle that really provides for robust civic participation because it's, of course, a diversity of perspectives that gives um, you know, the right to freedom of expression its full purpose in a democratic society. Um, and so with that in mind, I really think it's best to turn to, to you, Eduardo and Inez, to talk about your work. Um, both of you work with communities that are particularly vulnerable to marginalization. Um, so I'd love to hear from you more about inclusion in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have to turn this on again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... We've been, we have very much in our heart working with uh, marginalized communities as a political and a very much personal convincement among our members. And this translates into the very, let's say, traditional approaches in terms of empowering and saying, okay, if you're a vulnerable community, these are the sort of dangers that you, you can suffer online. So these are the tools that you can use in order to empower yourself a bit more, in order to take care not only of your, not only yourself, but also your community. So we've been working a lot with uh, LGBT communities, specifically with trans sex workers, trans women sex workers. And it's been really a more learning experience from us than from them, mm -hmm. because we've sort of been engaging into understanding what are the real threats that they have, both online and offline, mm -hmm. and recognizing the fact that there is little that we can do in terms of, like, they have really big problems of policemen killing them on the streets. So, like, when you go on this whole narrative of, like, digital security, they're like, okay, this is important, but hey, what can I do about this? So, like, this has also helped us understand a bit more about an holistic approach on security, in terms of like aligning with other actors that can also maybe provide digital sec um, safety, like physical security or psycho-emotional security as well. So it's been an interesting exercise that we're trying and we're starting to engage on in terms of like when we're talking with these communities, we should offer a more comprehensive approach into what is empowerment, what is security, and how can they exercise this. And also I would like to add up to that that that's sort of the negative aspects of, in a way, uh, exposing them to the dangers that they can suffer online and giving them also the, the measures to protect themselves from that. But also we believe that a more propositive approach should be, uh, create, should be uh, addressed in this community, so we try to uh, incentive uh, content creation. I think that you're, we're in a way talking about that. So local content and hearing other voices is very important for us. So we're building a radio station right now where we're trying to empower local communities of women and human rights defenders into creating podcasts, for instance. Like hearing our voices and putting them 
online is a way of resist patriarchy, is a way of resist silence, is a way of showing and telling histories that you normally don't hear. So I think that a multi and transversal approach into the discussion of democracy and how you can exercise it online is important. So that's why we try to not only do the protection part, but also try to do the content creation, the, the expansion and the creativity of, of individuals that normally are not very much welcome into showing and telling what they have to say. I think one of the things we do is to include all minorities and to make sure we don't reach when like the level where they are already vulnerable. So what we do, we do a lot of workshops with teenage girls that come from very poor families, very disadvantaged area. And these girls, they don't actually have computer in their houses. They don't have internet. They don't know what's going on in this world. So we're trying to, the workshops go from IT skills, how to write your resume, how to apply online, or how to even like listen to music and watch movies, and because they don't have all these tools. But what we want to do is to make sure that their voices are heard, even though we women represent 50% of the population on the internet side, we're, we're not. And there are a lot of problems. There are uh, one of the things that um, online harassment or women, they get they get bullied, and sometimes, I mean, uh, in my country, even on LinkedIn, which is a professional website, and women, they get online harassment on these uh, websites. So we're trying, uh, as I said, what we're trying to do all these workshops, but we're trying to connect them to digital rights. So we talk about this issue. We make sure that they have at least a basic level of digital security, and if they have violence, uh, they had, uh, they've been victim of violence, these are the platforms, this is how you reach for help, and this is how um, you can, maybe, because these are teenage girls, in three or four years, you're not going to find yourself uh, in a, a downer level compared to other people who have better resources than you. So in the context of that, I, I want to know, do you think, is technology neutral in that context, right, in the context of inclusion? Um, if we're, if you know, we're talking about the design choices that are made, you're talking about platforms, you're talking about building your own radio stations, right? So, um, and, and you're, you're, an, you're a technologist by, by training, right? So are, when we think about the design choices that go into the technologies that c certain communities are using, um, can we say that technology is neutral, that the design of them by industry actors is? I think that it is super important to understand that technology is not neutral. Technology is not neutral because it's built by men, normally white, from the global north. It's heterosexuals. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so like, when we're talking about understanding that as like the stepping stone, and it's important in order for them to understand how can we maybe not go out of the platforms. We're, like, we're not saying, OK, leave Facebook, leave Twitter, or you know. Yeah. But empower yourself and know that these are also some other tools that you can use in order to circumpass, in a way, this inegalitarian system that is right now uh, forced upon us. And I think that it's a really like profound discussion, like trying to change that particular problem right now, like the way technology is being built and the bias that is incorporated in them is difficult right now. And we cannot talk about leaving these spaces, but we have to force ourselves in. We have to make communities that are normally excluded listened, and making them understand that there are ways in which they can be listened as well. Because sometimes we probably, we sort of believe that there aren't that many channels to make ourselves heard effectively. So like knowing that there is a possibility of that is a first important part of trying to fight back and resist. Me? <laughs> um, I think we're trying to make it neutral. I think as a civil society, we're trying to at least give resources to everyone. Uh, when also, whenever I try to, to speak about inclusion, I, I also want to mention 
that there are people with disabilities who we should think about them when we think about w when we build our websites. And I'm, I'm a programmer. Whenever I build websites, oh, I can do it this way. But then I kind of have to force myself to remember these people. There are people that have disability in vision or hearing, and we should think about these uh, minorities that can they cannot reach for help as as much as we can. So yes, we are trying to make it neutral for everybody. Sometimes it's hard, but with the this is why um, a multi-stakeholder is very important because we, we represent really small actors, but together we are stronger. And with the, with the help of the government, with the help of organization, the global north, or if with a strong network, we can make it neutral. Um, yeah, I, de I definitely think we should talk about multi-stakeholderism more in a second. But first, I want to talk. I want to turn to Kathleen and Rose. You're you're entrepreneurs on the panel. Um, can you talk about the impact on uh, on local economies that manifest when digital rights are threatened? Should I start? Should okay. Um, so we are. I'm a digital entrepreneur, so I'm, I'm working with a tech community and a group of innovators and designers. So internet is very important for us, like most of our job is in the internet. So if there's no internet, we are disabled, right? So we are really make sure that we have um, communication line among t uh, between us and telco. So two weeks ago before I came here, there was no internet for three days. Like, what's happening? So I was traveling when I get back to my city. What's happening? And nobody knows what's happening. There was no advisory from the telecommunications company why there's no internet. And so because we have a strong community of tech startups and co-working spaces, um, I became a source of the advisory. So I talked to the telcos so what happened, and then I just posted it on my Facebook. And then um, we asked everyone, so OK, if you don't have internet at your home, you can come to this co-working space. We have internet here. So there were co-working spaces that were packed. Um, um, with, with digital freelancers, right? So very important for us is a free um, internet access and a free flow of information that is in discriminatory and unfiltered information for us to develop um, more innovative solutions. Yeah, and also um, in connection to Eduardo and Ines saying that could be an exclusive, like working with a tech uh, with the tech community is very important to make all these online platforms inclusive, like building the website as developers, programmers, and designers. We play a very important role to make you know, these pla online platforms accessible for everyone. And also working with the women community, there are two groups. There are women in tech who are very techy, and there are also women who are less access to internet and digital skills. So that's what we are doing right now. We want to build the gap. And um, so we organize ourselves as a women in tech and, and train them on how to use the digital platform like Facebook. So these women are just using Facebook with zero internet. Like it's a free data, but they can still access Facebook. They cannot see images, but they can see the headline of fake news. And, you know, they, are <laughs> they will be disinformed. They will just share it right away without, without really reading the content because it won't load on their cell phone because there's no internet. So... Um, that's one of the challenges we have right now. We have a community, that di that's the digital divide that I was talking earlier. There's a t community that is fully connected to the internet, and there's a community that is with zero data, but they are, you know, the source of proliferation of fake news of, uh, or misinformation. So, so that's what we are trying to do now as an entrepreneur in the digital space. We want to make sure that our rights is also protected. Like, women are aware that they are their human rights are you know violated or how what are the forms of violations against women online which only few women are aware of that so yeah <laughs> so so they say africa is the the final frontier of opportunities when it comes to business and it's it's not hype there's a lot of data to back that up um and i'm an entrepreneur who is not a digital entrepreneur but um, and, uh, I am an entrepreneur who works with other entrepreneurs and who provides uh, services to different uh, actors and government as well. And on the continent, it is a nightmare being an entrepreneur, basically. So to just to register a business is a problem. 
I, I actually export my goods from one African country to another, and that is a problem. Infrastructure is a problem. Travel is a problem. Immigration is an issue. Moving from one African country to the other is a problem. Communication is a, access is a problem. If you are a woman entrepreneur, it's a problem. <laughs> so, so to add digital rights violations to that problem is it's it's an implosion. If you ask me, it's a recipe for disaster on a continent where it has been proven that our economies are growing because of digital technology. So we are creating, uh, if you look at most of the young entrepreneurs, the startup community, uh, entrepreneurs who are not even part of the startup uh, community, opportunities have been created because of you know, uh, uh, digital technology. Um, we've the way work is being done is changing. There is employment. There are more people coming into the workforce. Jobs are being transformed. Um, Cameroon currently, for example, has an unemployment rate of 4.51%. That's conservative, if you ask me. And it is increasing because of digital rights, you know, violations and other human rights violations. We're able to bring our businesses easier to customers. Um, we are improving our business models and strategies. Yet, we have um, governments who are meant to be enablers of the, of the environment to allow us to flourish in business and contribute more to the economy, actually stifling us. And I'll give you examples. Uh, the, the shutdown that happened in Cameroon last year cost the government and estimate cost the country the economy an estimated four million dollars that's crazy for an <laughs> for a country whose gdp to to uh, ratio is increasing the gdp to debt ratio is increasing by one percent every month you need money you have a private sector that is vibrant and is giving you money more than you could have had 20 years ago, and yet you are stifling these people using all sorts of forms of, of, of uh, uh, I mean, methods and tools. They are attacking uh, business owners using financial penalties. I own a business. I have 23,000 followers on Twitter. I am a digital activist. I have to speak up because I have to participate civically. The next thing I know, someone is in my, in, my, in, my, in, in my shop asking me questions that are totally unrelated, you know, to the business that I am doing and probably penalizing me with more tax and things like that. So the sort of challenges that we are facing are enormous. Another side of it is, you know, a, 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 a lot of young people are actually owning businesses in, 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 in the digital economy sector. So there's a lot of bloggers who have made money by just being a blogger and providing that sort of content online. These are people who are directly targeted. Cameroon has a, a digital economy strategic plan, those nice convoluted things, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which is a 600 million sorry, 600 billion francs CFA, that's one billion dollar, five year project. Mm. Don't ask me what they're doing with that plan when they can shut down a part of the country and cause the entire startup community that lives in that part of the country to create a camp, a ref an internet refugee camp, to be able to continue services in, in, you know, in that part of, of the world. So we face so many challenges um, and attacks directly, not just on you know, human rights violations. Currently, there's a crisis in the country. We are the fourth largest cocoa producer on the continent. That cocoa is being produced in the English-speaking regions where there is a crisis and where um, farmers have been forced to run into the bushes and abandon that product and activists are trying to talk about this this problem and to participate and to negotiate 
and we're being shut down. So it's really, really difficult to be a business uh, a, a person on a continent where, you know, the private sector is not enabled to carry out business, and at the same time, you know, you're being, your freedom of expression online and off is being muzzled. We'll probably talk about, you know, the strategies of how we can fight that in a bit, but I just thought we need to have a foundation of how, you know, the, the, the private sector is suffering from all this. Yeah, it seems pretty clear that there are a lot of problems to get through. <laughs> uh, so I think it's probably a, a great segue to start talking about the strategies, right? How do we respond to these challenges? How do we mobilize? Who do we work with, et cetera? Um, and I think from there, uh, starting to move from general concepts, when we think about uh, advocacy and even activism conceptually, it's uh, usually conceived um, externally as being in opposition to, to government, whether implicitly or explicitly. Is that understanding correct in your view? I'm going to start. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, I think it seems like to a lot of people as an activist, oh, you're basically working against the government. You just like don't want to get things done. But we're not. We're not. Actually, we want to wor work with the government. In most of the cases, this is what we're doing. We work with the government, trying to negotiate with them and to, to get things done. And sometimes, I mean, I had to, a lot of meetings with the government. Sometimes they're not doing something that we're against that intentionally, sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge. They don't know if we're going to pass this law, it will have all these consequences. And I think it's our role as a civil society to talk with them and explain it to them, all of these problems, and to, to move forward. The civil society as experts, right? As subject matter experts yeah. that can lend knowledge. So just wanted to add to that. I think in Pakistani context, I don't want them to believe that I work against the government. Uh, it's not what I, I don't, I don't want to project myself in that manner, but it's probably the government or it's probably those working for the government. They want to project that narrative in the minds of the people that, oh, these are the people who work against the government. These are the people who work with, you know, they have an international agenda and they want to, you know, defame Pakistan. So, I mean, that mentality does not come from civil society. That mentality basically comes from the other side that does not want to work with us. I mean, we wanted to engage with them on different laws. Um, we, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that, that um, the cybercrime bill that was passed in 2016, government tried to ensure that they incorporate point of views of every sector. But again, you know, at certain point, they would stop you. You know, you, we can't talk to you on that anymore. That's what their response was. But you know, on, on cybercrime bill, the engagement was there. But you know, on a broader level, that mentality does not come from civil society. It basically comes from the other side that does not want to engage with the civil society in Pakistani context. Mm -hmm. So what does, that, what does that look like in practice, though, as in terms of implementing that kind of strategy, trying to work with government, trying to act as experts? Yeah. Um, in the Philippines, Working with the government is very important. Like they have been our best, <laughs> best ally. So the thing in the Philippines is digital rights literacy is very low. Like not just the community level that needs literacy on that. Also the people who are developing the policy. And right now, these new issues on on internet rights, violation against women online, and all the issues that arise from development of technology is not being, being taught in school. And, and that's been a challenge because it means that even the, the, the top um, of, the, of the national governments, like their awareness as well on internet rights is um, not enough. And that it means that the legal system in the Philippines is not ready to address or take on the challenge of addressing the human rights issues on the digital space. But working with us as an, like, an expert, a more uh, wide network and knowledge is, is very important. And for us, it be, they become an enabler for us to connect and reach out to the community level, especially the marginalized sectors like PWDs. They have, they have the network to call the assembly for all these people for us to um, spread awareness like I was working with the tech for ed centers of Department of Information and Communications Technology to do digital literacy, data analytics and data governance and they provide venue for all these advocacy activities for us. I think that in Paraguay it's also very important to work with the government but 
what Ines is saying is very key, like the lack of knowledge of policymakers and congressmen in general in Paraguay in the digital rights space is a constant problem that translates in a lot of initiatives, in a lot of laws that are very much similar between one another. And then you're sometimes like, oh, again, we have to talk about the same issues with them about privacy, freedom of expression. But it is important to engage. And also to add to what, to what, what they were saying, uh, coalition building is very important, uh, at least in our context in Latin America in general. So like going to civil society experts, even though it is a very important thing, and you can give a lot of arguments in the frame of human rights and democracy, there are also other arguments that we need from the private sector, for instance. So digital economy, empowerment, economical empowerment, those are other arguments that sometimes can speak a bit more closely to the people that are in power and that inter inter integrated and presented as a whole has a much more interesting impact to government. Maybe the question in our context should be, is it possible to work with government? <laughs> or, you know, but every time we put that in our minds, you know, as advocates, we, we try to find the avenues of possibility uh, of engagement, of handshake. So sometimes it's not working with government directly. It is finding who will intervene for us, uh, you know, or on behalf of us to government to get a certain issue uh, resolved or introduced or all that. So we found that you can go through the private sector. So MTN is the, as a telecoms provider, it's the biggest, it contributes a lot of money to the government, the government is willing to listen to them. So you go to MTN, and some of you in the room actually work with organizations that our governments respect, um, and it, with different projects, so there's, there's this possibility there. Sometimes we go directly and find the technocrat in, in government and work with them to pro probably enact a bill and things like that. So wherever we can find possibilities and wherever the government doesn't feel that their positions and their interests are threatened, then it, it's possible to, to engage. So it seems like in some cases, like particularly what Inez and Rose were talking about, sometimes the government recognizes that it needs expertise that it does not have within itself and it's looking for capacity to be filled that civil society can fill. In other cases, governments aren't necessarily aware that they need help. Um, and that, it seems like what the Lal and Kathleen and Eduardo, what you're all talking about is coalition building and network building that is more multi-stakeholder, that goes beyond a bilateral process of civil society talking to government, government reaching out to civil society, um, and that kind of discourse to be something more that brings in the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and so in that sense, it's, it seems like we're all in agreement that multi-stakeholderism, the multi-stakeholder approach, is in itself an effective strategy and tool. But what then do we need in order to cultivate effective multi-stakeholderism? How does this model work? What are the elements we need to be thinking about in building what you're talking about, which is an effective coalition? I think political will, basically. Um, I just came to know that the Pakistani Ministry of Information and Technology put together the first draft of the data protection law, and they are inviting everybody's comments uh, via email. But then, um, it, I mean, it's a great sign that they want people to comment on that, but then I read this tweet at the Twitter page of a, a well-known digital rights organization that said that we are so proud to work with the government. And I, w and I kept wondering that where have we been? I mean, why did not they ensure that we were also part of the process as well? So I think um, there is this one side where the government has to send you the invites, but then there are certain organizations even within the civil society who have more leverage and, or influence it, or they have more access to the government. They have a responsibility to ensure that, you know, everybody is invited to the table as well. So um, I think in Pakistani context, um, the multi-stakeholder approach has not been, um, uh, it, it, is, it has not, people are not really aware about the multi-stakeholder approach. Those who are aware about the multi-stakeholder approach, they probably are not interested at the moment. They see it as a privilege to work with government, to be the only organization to work with the government. You know, this is the kind of mentality that I see, which is, a, uh, that I see is a problem uh, in the face of multi-stakeholder engagement. 
I, I think that um, uh, making a business case is also really important um, for, for effective multi-stakeholder uh, engagement. Everyone, uh, every one of us wants, wants an open internet. But then we have different interests in terms of why or how we want that to work for us. The same with, you know, the government. So it's, it's really important to make a clear business case from stakeholder to stakeholder to be able to, uh, you know, showcase the, 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 the benefits maybe, for want of a better word, especially to, to government, which is a, a really important stakeholder as we all come together with our strengths. And also, another, another strategy would pr probably be to, um, to create more capacity, more uh, educational, uh, it, it, there's a need, basically, for, for educational um, empowerment in, in that sense. So some stakeholders are not digital rights or digital uh, uh, advocates. They are possibly or probably um, uh, other rights oriented and so it's important for us to understand and to learn and to know what works where what will work best and to get examples what has worked elsewhere and what will work well in our own local uh, context we, we cannot copy and paste so if we're able to look at these different strategies as as, as, as stakeholders then maybe we can make more impact on the ground. So as Juliet was saying earlier, talking about evidence-based approaches mm -hmm. and making your case that way. And then also translation, right? Which is another key thing that you're talking about. Yeah. Talking, using the same language that other stakeholders are using and trying to find shared terminology to, to work with them. That's something we were talking about earlier sure. as, a, as a common challenge that we all face as civil society. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and so I want to throw it over to the audience to see if you have questions. I see hands already going up, which is great. Um, would you mind, uh, when, I, when I pick out your uh, faces, would you mind just starting by introducing your name and your affiliation before going ahead with your questions? And we'll take a, a couple at a time and then pose it, uh, pose it to our panel. So please. Ahmed Imam from uh, Internews. Actually, I will uh, share your uh, experience because we have the same problem. I'm coming from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, our parliament just uh, last month, they approved a new law about uh, cyber crime, what they call cyber crime, which is okay. But I mean, they added just, uh, just one item that attacking the government is a cyber crime, which is banished for five years and $1 million punishment. And my question is, with all your great, I, 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 first I should uh, have a status saying that this is a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And coming back, uh, my question is, uh, what is your recommendation? Because now I think the attacks against internet and the freedom, and I'm sure they are encouraged what happening in the United States. Uh, so you have the experience to see if the government is having censorship. Do you devise a way to evade this censorship? And as you say, you start working, you, you continue working with the government, but at the same time, uh, relay your message in a free way. Thank you. There's a question in the back there. Um, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Judith Nwana. Um, I'm from Cameroon and a member of CHRI is Cameroon. Humanitarian Relief Initiative. Um, first of all, just to say I'm proud to have my friend Kathleen on the, on the panel <laughs> from Cameroon. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's um, internet shutdown is a very sore point for me, uh, as Kathleen said earlier, uh, being from Cameroon. And just to give a bit of feedback, um, the first round, that is between January 2017 to date, the Cameroon government shut down the internet just for the Anglophone regions, that's English speaking. Round one, 94 days. Round two, 134 days. And we are currently going to round three. And I'm going round three, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. internet restrictions yeah. uh, in the country. So you can imagine uh, what life is like there, and there's an ongoing conflict. 
So my question to the panel is, we can talk all we like. The government doesn't listen. What is your strategy and the international community in general, because I know they are watching, how do citizens, one, walk around this? Because governments, especially the one like in Cameroon, will keep doing it. Elections are coming up, well, supposed elections, presidential elections are coming up in October. I bet you something is going to happen. Secondly, how do you penalize governments to make sure this doesn't happen again and again and again? Because other governments, not only Cameroon, they are watching. Other dictators are watching and they know they can get away with it. I know Afrinik did suggest withholding IP addresses. That died a death. So wh what do we do? Do we just sit and let it happen? Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, fine, one more question and then we'll pose it to the panel. Hi, uh, Will Ferragero, consultant on uh, media and conflict. A question, you alluded to it at the end of the discussion here about kind of coalition building, and I, and I, I wondered maybe you could draw that out a little bit in your various perspectives. When I was doing internet freedom work at Internews, um, we worked, we, we, we found that even locally within countries that many of the traditional human rights organizations stayed in their sector, stayed in their lane, and the digital rights people were in their lane, and the media folks were in their lane, and there was not a lot of collaboration amongst and uh, across the different sectors. Um, and I'm wondering if you can kind of update that. Maybe that's changed a little bit now that people are, there's more and more people born digital, and, and, and we're, we're seeing that. Um, but I also wondered if, if either of you, one of the other uh, dynamics we noticed was that some countries were uh, uh, amenable or influenced by regional trends and could be could be uh, in regional norms and could be kind of persuaded uh, uh, to act based on being left behind and I think of Myanmar is is, is one example of, of falling behind a subregion in terms of norms so I'm wondering if you could reflect on that in your respective uh, respective countries thank you Okay, so to recap, we have a question on uh, tactics for circumventing censorship, even while continuing to work with the government, particularly in the context of national security interests and the development of cybercrime bills. Um, then we also have a question on what to do when the government doesn't listen to us in our national context. What kind of strategies and tactics do we engage in um, in, in that context, particularly when it, uh, in the case of Cameroon and internet shutdowns and shutdown culture? Um, and then the third question was about coalition building and whether silos still exist even within the civil society space, how to break those silos down in order to create effective coalitions. Um, and I think the second part of that question was almost in tandem with the, with the second question that was given, um, which was about, um, about whether governments feel like they're falling behind even on a regional level when it comes to norm development uh, when it, in, in terms of internet related norms. Um, so I'll throw it over to you, to the panel if anyone wants to answer any part of those questions. Yeah. I would like to start, oops. <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer to all of the questions, but to the last one in particular, it speaks really close because coalition building, even though it is uh, the most effective tool, <coughs> it is also a really hard one to get to. And uh, in the Paraguayan context at least, um, the, we're right now the only digital rights organization that is working uh, specifically in, on these issues. There are organizations talk, uh, working on freedom of expression, and organizations working on access to information, but they don't do the linkage to the digital space. So it's been quite uh, a challenge in a way to engage with those groups because they have different agendas also. And there's a the matter of resources as well in Paraguay. So like there are, we're a small country, so there aren't very much resources allocating to or particular context because there are other countries that are bigger like Argentina and Brazil that are sort of like in a way taking all of the resources from international aid. Mm -hmm. But even so there are conversations and according to the context 
there has been uh, effective experiences in terms of supporting each other when there is a build project coming out or when we need, for instance, um, so I'll say like a brief example. Like we had this problem, a very known uh, lesbian declared journalist suffered, she gained access to this Facebook chat where there was this famous blogger and his friends talking about how they should rape her to correct her sexual orientation. So we did a comment and we did the screens because since the journalist accessed this chat, she was enabled to make them public and she did it. She did it on Facebook, she did it on Twitter, sorry. So once she did it, we did this analysis on how this was a gender uh, violence example online. It, it was like a very explicit example. And because of that, the blogger, which is like a famous YouTube blogger, um, he uh, opened us, I don't know how to say it in English, sorry, like a, he filed a suit against us. Mm -hmm. So like he gave us a lot of problems, judiciary, and they forced us to take the content out of the, out of her blog. And they forced the journalist to take the content out of her Twitter account, quoting that it was a problem of, um, you know, reputation of this person and blah, blah, blah. And organizations were very helpful in terms of positioning and helping us to make a case on why this was a problem and it wasn't due process. And luckily we ended up winning the case at the end, so we were able to put that content online again. But it is like a, so, sort of, it sort of answers your question in terms of like when there's a problem, in the end organizations do tend to ally within their own possibilities as well. And also the private sector, when there is a problem, it tends to come to civil society and their coalition building starts to um, happen. But so far it has been more of a pro coalition building has only happened through like processes like urgencies. Like it's not a very um, active, yeah. Con like a it doesn't continue on time. So once the problem is solved, the connections stays, but it's not a there there aren't that many follow ups. If, if I could add to that, and you've stated exactly what I wanted to say, that we often see coalitions coming into play when, it, when there's an event that's taking place. Yeah. And what we want is, a, as you mentioned, a continuum of relationships between the different players, the traditional human rights activists, um, private sector, academia, researchers, you know, want, want everybody to come together. But we often see it very event-based. We saw this most recently in Uganda with the social media taxes where it went from zero to 100 in a matter of hours. We had women's rights organization coming in full swing, setting an agenda based on um, the gender digital divide. We had private sector putting it um, in terms of the impact that the taxes will have on the informal economy, on the growth of um, the general uh, GDP of the country. And then we had civil society, uh, joining forces, um, the, the traditional human rights organizations, and entities like ours, which focus on <coughs> digital rights coming together and advancing the cause. But beyond that, we also had relationships with parties outside of Uganda. So it became a regional thing. We had um, very, very strong alliances and relationships with entities like the Web Foundation, uh, the, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, whose data helped strengthen everybody's arguments, helped strengthen the case of the gender rights adv advocates to help uh, strengthen the human rights case, well, the digital rights case to help strengthen the um, private sector's case. So we're seeing the movement of information becoming a whole lot stronger at that key point in time. But yes, we'd like this to happen a whole lot more consistently. One of the ways that we're trying to address this is by bringing people together physically um, and saying this is a safe space to have some of these discussions. We bring the government officials the, uh, into the room, we bring the telcos, we bring human rights activists in the traditional space, we bring digital rights um, uh, activists, you know, everybody come together, um, researchers, academia, let's have a conversation about this, let's speak the same language for a change, because often when we're in the silos, we look at things very differently um, and often walk with, skews, with skewed perspectives. So that's one of the ways that we as an organization are doing this. I, I shared a tweet about it. We host an annual forum on internet freedom, which serves to do exactly that in the different 
countries. Um, uh, Kathleen mentioned earlier that sometimes these conversations happen in spaces beyond our capacity to access across the ocean. Sometimes even within the continents, it's impossible to join some of these conversations. So we try to bring it to a national level, um, inviting people from the different co students, come ask your questions to uh, Facebook. <laughs> it's very exciting, but it brings some of these issues a whole lot more alive to different players. Um, so that's one thing that we're really excited about doing in building those relationships um, and in advancing um, the cause. But beyond that, we've also seen that when, when it's all said and done, we've seen relationships continue to advocate for the different um, issues that have been brought to the table. So that's, that's an exciting thing. It may also happen to be an event, but <coughs> we're trying to build that momentum of um, a consistent relationship between different players across the different countries. And uh, so Very quickly in the Pakistani context, I think we are not, as I mentioned earlier, we are not very well versed with the multi-stakeholder co uh, concept. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know why is that, but um, for the past uh, 11 months um, I've been writing uh, a lot about what is happening in the tech community in terms of digital rights, what is happening in the media sector and also in this digital rights community. So we are not basically well versed, we are still working in silos uh, at the moment. I think one way forward, uh, the, w uh, the way forward to you know make them well versed in multi-stakeholder concept is to have an IGF in Pakistan. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, for one way or the other, we have not been able to hold our country-specific internet governance forum. So I think this is an opportunity where we can invite people from different sectors and we can talk about a lot of issues. I actually went to one uh, cyber secure security conference in Pakistan and I got the opportunity to attend that conference because uh, my friend was there and she, she told me that I can uh, access that conference. But when I went there, I realized that a lot of the discussions uh, uh, in the technical community, w uh, I mean, it was a cybersecurity conference, and I was expecting that people will be there to talk about the political aspects of cybersecurity. But to my surprise, they were only talking about the technical aspects of cybersecurity. So I, I asked them that, you know, don't you think that cybersecurity is also a political question as well? It's not just a technical question as well. So, I mean, there, there is an opportunity to collaborate. There are people who believe that we should collaborate more, but there is no forum at the moment. And I think, in my opinion, um, at the moment where people are not aware, Internet Governance Forum should, should be held in Pakistan and something like RightsCon can be held in Pakistan as well. Coming back, coming to another question which was asked about uh, what is the way forward if the government is not listening to you uh, and they continue to go for Internet shutdowns. So um, in 2016, I guess, um, uh, we uh, had the same problem. Pakistani government loves to go for the internet shutdowns off and on. So um, a number of citizens, they took the government to the high court and they said that um, the government does not, has, does not have the power to shut down internet. The law that they use is uh, telecommunication law and, and the law basically says that if there is an emergency situation, government can um, um, shut down a uh, network. Uh, the decision came out uh, in favor of the citizens in February 20, 2018, and it said that the government was interpreting it wrongly. Uh, for, for, for the government to shut down internet in emergency situation, they, should, they need to follow up, a, a prescribe a, a very uh, clearly laid out procedure of emergency. So for instance, if you want to declare emergency in Pakistan, you, the president has to issue a decree. Um, uh, so there is a process that has to be followed. So the court said that the government was uh, not interpreting the law correctly, and they declared the internet shutdown illegal. So that is one way of, you know, if, you're the, if the government is not listening, you can basically go to the court and, and see if uh, the decision comes in your favor. Well, <laughs> it's interesting that you said so, and Judith, thank you for the great work that you do, um, that you have done in the last couple of months to advocate for this. It's, it's been phenomenal. Um, when, you ha when you come from a country where the government owns the judiciary, yeah. owns the military, and controls and can muzzle the media, you are, you are in trouble, basically. But what I want to put forth is that Cameroon is and a very important player on the continent. We're the largest economy in Central Africa and with really critical resources that are contributing to growing you know, the economies of those other co uh, countries in, in the region. So the, 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 the regional and the international community has to understand 
how important we are. And I think from, from that perspective, we'll be able to find strategies to ensure that this country is kept open in terms of human rights and in terms of uh, digital rights. Now, to answer your question, Judith, my, my personal opinion, and I've said this before, is that it gets to a point where you need to think about sanctions. I, for one, I prefer that governments that are continuously and continually perpetrating these sort of violations be personally and economically sanctioned than citizens continuously becoming casualties of human rights violations and casualties of, of war, because um, that's where we are at, at this time. That's possibly a, a, a strategy. I, I don't know how that will work. I need to, we need to sit and think about which sort of sanctions will really pinch uh, and pain <laughs> governments to actually responding to what we want. Also, I think that investors need to begin to understand that governments that are continuously perpetrating these violations um, would, would possibly not get the same investments that, 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 that they are getting, whether it's international grants or aid or, or, or just investments. We need to think in that direction. Litigation has not worked. It will not work. We already know that. Um, so, and also, there's too few in Cameroon at the moment. There's too few defenders, if you, if you ask me, um, of, of digital rights. There are probably a lot of defenders of human rights, but there are few defenders of, of, of digital rights. And so we need to grow a more vibrant community of advocates, of, of activists, you know, that would be able to put enough pressure on, on, on the government as it were right now, and who would be able to work w better in, in terms of coalition building to make these things happen. Just yeah, you can very Just quickly, add, uh, yeah, very about quickly about the Egypt case because I'm very familiar with, and we have in Tunisia we have similar law that are basically attacking the military or the government on just like but tweeting or on Facebook you can be in jail. I think what all my friends that said is really amazing. But one key which is very important, especially in regions like Tunisia and in, in uh, Egypt, digital literacy is very important. We th we need to make sure that everyone understand the how important this is and how catastrophic these are uh, these law because in, in this country like when we talk about surveillance the people say oh maybe surveillance is a good thing because we have terrorists we have all these attacks but no we need to make sure that everyone understand everyone has the right to advocate for all for all these and then maybe uh, all of the coalition building and the multi-stakeholders we can defend against this Thank you. All right, we are well over time. But uh, before we finish, just considering our audience, um, these are implementers that are mo mostly based here. And so I think uh, when uh, to leave things um, very quickly, like one sentence per, um, what is a message that you would like to give to the audience um, in their allyship to you in, in your work as digital rights defenders? How can they be allies? I mean, I think we are stronger if we are together. I think our voices can be heard if if we all talk with with each other and the the support of the global north to the to the, to the south country is very important either it's finance or just by saying what we have to say and tweeting or or discussing with other people. Um, that's a hard question, but I think that there the message that I would like to leave to the audience is that in Paraguay there's still a lot to do in terms of regulation, in terms of, pro of build projects that need to be multi-stakeholder way developed, um, communities that need to be heard and that still need to access to the internet. So my message would be like, we need your help into doing all this stuff, into coalition building with organizations outside of our countries hearing other experiences, and, well, resources is always important, too. So <laughs> yeah. um, yes, everything they've said. I just add that we need to build on the capacities of more research um, skilled Africans to develop the um, 
We need to build on the amount of research coming out of the continent. This means we need to expand on the number of people doing um, research work on digital rights, the skills involved in building um, that capacity. There's a, there's a myriad of, uh, of tools that can be used to advance digital rights. Sometimes you think of research in the tra traditional sense of focus groups and, um, mm. you know, but they, we're dealing with online, so there is, uh, we need to be thinking of different ways of measuring the internet. Um, and building those tools, those, those, those tools, and bridging that to the advocacy work for more actors um, in the multi-stakeholder <laughs> grouping, but also to strengthen the case made to governments based on this evidence. I think that is something that we need to be working on, and of course, um, the support for that is needed. But also creating the spaces for such conversations to happen more often in our own spaces, within our own countries. That is something that we need to do a whole lot more work on and get more support on. And yeah, you know, bringing more of the conversation back home as opposed to having it come two, three individuals across the ocean. Um, I, yeah. I don't know how many people are watching this back home. So we need, yeah, we need a whole lot more of this going on there across different players, students, researchers, artists. You know, there's, this, uh, there's so much opportunity that we need to explore. So for me, this leadership program is really great and it's an empowering, especially for me that come from a small organization. This becomes a global platform for us to share good practices and experiences and build on that so we can improve our programs and advocacies back on our country. And so this is like, I'm so happy that we have a wider network of allies here in the room. And, and if there are like, people from the UN organizations, maybe we can help um, <laughs> advocate to the government of the Philippines like to examine existing laws and propose laws to align that and to be consistent in the humanitarian um, and human rights. And the last thing I want to stress out is like for us to scale up and have a wider scope of our advocacy. Yes, I agree with the resources, whether it's financial resources in kind, um, capacity building and more of empowering um, activities like this one, yeah. So just to what Juliet said, you said we need more resources to do research. I would say we need more resources to do and to produce up-to-date and timely research because the digital landscape changes every six months. So we need to make sure that people who are advocating for digital rights, they have up-to-date uh, information uh, around the digital rights issues. Uh, one way of going about it is to have a website like Digital Rights Monitor in Pakistani context, but you know there are there are opportunities to expand it to have a an Asian Digital Rights Monitor where people are able to you know timely report for a website and you know make sure that people ho who are advocating advocating for digital rights they have the timely information as well. And uh, definitely, um, we can talk about the capacity building, and we can also talk about the resources. Uh, 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 to do research on social media as well because and uh, I've seen that whether it is academia in Pakistan or it is the civil society we do not we are not well versed with the research tools to look at social media as well so uh, it would be great if we could connect with some people and folks who could help us uh, pursue their research in social media as well I would say that um, there is a, there is always a diaspora of us you know, everywhere. The, the, our global networks can work more effectively with the diaspora who understands the local uh, context to be able to deliver. They are more protected than who we are. Um, uh, uh, and they can, they, it has been proven that they have uh, made a lot of impact with the work that, that they do for their own countries, whether, I mean, whether it's financially or, or whether it's uh, in advocacy. So, um, we, we, can, we can work that way. I think there also needs to be a lot of understanding of the local context. And beyond that, um, we need a lot of regional support uh, and pressure on regional bodies who could possibly put pressure on, on, on local, uh, on regional, sorry, on, on national governments to ensure. I, 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 it's a shame that a, a body like the AU you know, would not take up some of these things, even if it's just to create awareness of what is happening in Cameroon. So there needs to be some sort of uh, trickle down, if you ask me, pressure um, to ensure that maybe some, some, something will give somewhere. 
Um, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mevish. Thank you, uh, panelists. I'm sure you can see why we're so excited to have these people leading these efforts to develop advocacy and strategies because they have so much expertise. Um, I know a lot of you probably have other questions. The, uh, they will be able to uh, stick around for a couple of minutes. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to engage with them individually. Um, and also pick up uh, some of the uh, literature that we have that might be of interest to you as well. Uh, thank you very much again for coming. <laughs>